Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really happy to have you with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity is with us today. He joins us from the site of some of the most dramatic moments we have ever seen. None of them were last night. Uh, they were all in the 1990s, and if you're a hockey fan, uh, more last decade. But, uh, Jim, nonetheless, the first night of the convention, I think, wrapped up about five minutes ago. So uh, <laughs> you've had a lot of time to... No, they're still giving the benediction. It's still going. <laughs> For honesty's sake, we should let people know that we're taping around 11.50 your time, 10.50 my time. And that one-hour time difference has screwed me up for every meeting I've had so far. So. <laughs> Fantastic. The cost of coordinate. What time are we taping? Okay, is that East time? Is that Central time? <laughs> I have no idea what time it is. Maybe the whole point was just for Biden to finish at a later time than Trump so he could even claim victory in that in some small... Well, they said part, part two of, of Biden's remarks are tonight. I, I, stay tuned, everyone. <laughs> All right, well, let's get to our uh, three martinis here. I'm not sure there's a, a good one, but nonetheless, Biden's speech began at almost 11.30 Eastern time. We'll talk more about that in the second martini. But Biden came out full of, um, well, stuff and vinegar about a number of issues, uh, but mainly he was out there yelling the whole time about his record and what he thinks is a fantastic record. There's also some uh, tremendous fabulism in there. He uh, repeated some things that have now been thoroughly debunked for quite a while. But on the issue of the border, for example, he offered this. Then I had to take executive action. The result of the executive action I took, border encounters have dropped over 50 percent. In fact, there are fewer border crossings today than when Donald Trump left office. Jim, I don't know if that's true. A lot of people doubt it. If it is true, it's because of his no deportations in the first 100 days, and they're already flooding to the border in January 2021. But the larger point is he could have stopped this on day two uh, by not doing uh, uh, those executive orders. Uh, and then he offered this one, which seems like a misstatement, but then when you look at the whole comment, it's weird. Kamala and I are committed to strengthening legal immigration, including protecting dreamers and more. They're committed to strengthening illegal immigration. You would have thought he might have said legal, but then he talks mm -hmm. about dreamers who were illegal immigrants. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and then he talked about 16 million jobs, which we know most of those are just you're allowed to be back open so your employees yeah, can come back. I heard back. it as 60 million. 60? Which, <laughs> Why not? As which, long? Yeah, it's, it, I know Biden is not as, as clear in speaking as he used to, but I, yeah, why not? Why not 60 million? There's only 300, 330 million Americans. You know? <laughs> right. And then uh, he said that he and Kamala, you know, successfully got schools back open when uh, the left were the ones trying to keep it closed. Uh, and then we got classic, classic uh, Biden uh, on this particular issue when it related to abortion. The United States Supreme Court majority wrote the following, quote, women are not without electrical, without, not allowed, not without electoral, electoral or political power. No kidding. Okay, so I'm guessing at that point, most Democrats were like, yeah, yeah, we made the right call there. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, Jim, in terms of Biden's constant shouting, his uh, fiction on his record, uh, what stood out most to you? You know, Greg, I'll get to this couple of the points you mentioned there in a second. I, I think if you looked at the mainstream media coverage uh, of this morning, a lot of it was, wow, there was a lot of love in that room for Joe Biden last night. And I'm just wondering, like, yes, because he's leaving. That's they're, they're happy to see him leave. Goodbye, Joe. We don't have to have to drag your butt over the finish line one more time. You're no longer a liability to us. You're somebody else's problem. Um, yeah, like, like if if Biden had not withdrawn from the race, I don't think you'd be hearing these good vibes. I don't think you'd be seeing this energy and enthusiasm and, and all that stuff. People are very happy to see. Joe Biden lead the stage. And, and that's that was kind of one of the things that made this awkward. We'll talk a bit more about this in, the, in our later martinis. On the claim that uh, attempts to cross the border illegally are down now from when Biden took office. Greg, I don't know if we've explored the possibility that it's simply because Central America has emptied out, <laughs> that they, they don't have anybody left. It's, it's, yeah. uh, and when he's talking about the electrical women, the women who get electoral power, electro clearly he means cyborg women. And... Uh, <laughs> amazing new things they're doing out in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. No, um, 
a lot of people claim that this was a good speech. And then when they talk about it, they talk about the audience's reaction. So they don't actually talk about things Joe Biden said. It was a very shouty speech. Uh, my colleague Noah Rothman pointed out that a lot of the early sections about democracy at being at risk. A lot of that was like almost verbatim what he was saying in his Independence Hall speech uh, a couple of years ago. And then there were others about his accomplishments. A lot of that was from the State of the Union. One of the things I think was really surprising about it, and I'll talk a bit more about this in our, our third martini, is that it was did not seem like a different speech than if he would have you know, given if he were the nominee. Maybe 90 percent of it was the same. It looks like they took the speech that they had expected to give and about every couple of paragraphs. And they said, and Kamala helped with that a lot, too. And, yeah. and kind of just, you know, crossed out. And I'm proud to be your nominee here. By the way, they didn't do it for the, the plat party platform. <laughs> party platform a whole bunch of times refers to by. I mean, I make copy editing editors all the time. By, you know, that's why we have copy editors to try to catch my mistakes. But come on, folks, this, you've had a month. This didn't just happen uh, a week ago. Uh, again, next time somebody says, could you believe what's in the platform? Clearly not even the parties read their own platform. So I don't think this is quite the, the bombshell everybody thinks it is. Um, no, but it, the other thing was that, like, it, it was Joe Biden's greatest hits. I wasn't a fan of these the first time around. I'm not thrilled. You know, you know you can't only love your country when you win. And you know, uh, Trump never built a damn thing. Like, he, look, I'm not a huge fan of Trump, but he builds a lot of stuff. Like, that's the, you know, that's the, like, of all the things you could hit Trump on, he's never built anything. Like, never mind, here in Chicago, there's this giant, you know, skyscraper. It's got Trump on it, right? All over America, there's, you know, Trump buildings. That's not really his problem, right? Unions built the middle class. Uh, suckers and losers. It's all just stuff we've heard from Joe Biden a lot of times before. And, you know, the timing didn't make it any better. Um, and it didn't really allegedly. So allegedly the word was he was going to speak for half an hour. It went 50 minutes. Some of that's applause. But I really am, I don't think, no, like this, this need, this, I, I would have said to, to Biden, scrap it. This is too similar. If this really is your grand farewell to the country, it calls for something different. It calls for something bigger. It calls for something more heartfelt. It calls, we're talking about the lessons you've learned in office. Um, and it doesn't need to be the usual State of the Union laundry list of look at all these things we've done. And nope, that's what we got. And as I think, you know, he's not sticking around for the rest of the convention. And I don't think that there are many people here who are all that turned up about that. No, no. The outgoing president usually doesn't stick around, but the outgoing president usually didn't get shoved off the ticket. So <laughs> well, Lyndon Johnson was the last one for that to happen, too. There's one uh, tweet that I found fascinating. Keith Ellison former uh, congressman, now attorney general of Minnesota, tweeted about how great the Biden speech was as he was standing outside the United Center at 11.02 p.m. Chicago time. So Keith Ellison thinks it was a fabulous speech, even though he bailed on it midway through, apparently. <laughs> well, 11, okay, 11 o'clock local, 11 o'clock your time. 11 o'clock. Because uh, 11 o'clock your time, time hadn't even started. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was Chicago okay. time, so maybe he caught the beginning okay. of it, but uh, yeah, yeah. He wasn't sticking around for the end of it. Once again, listeners can tell. I can't tell time differences when there's just a one hour difference. If we're on the West Coast, it'd be a lot easier. I think it's easier when you grow up in the Midwest like I did on Central Time. And so you constantly have to convert when you're growing up. All but the commercials not. used to say eight o'clock Eastern, nine cent or, or you know, nine o'clock Eastern, eight central. Yes. But, you know, we don't we don't do that in commercials anymore. It's it's central time zone bias. It's, it's erasure of the other time zones. <laughs> All right, Jim, on to our second martini now. And this was this would certainly be a bad martini for Joe Biden, but uh, I don't know if it is for us. Usually you want to wrap up your evening around 11 p.m. Eastern time. That's the end of prime time. You don't want to make your local news angry. You want your local news to kind of just build right off of that if you're, if you're the party having your convention. Once upon a time, get to your late night shows. But last night they were way, way, way behind. I thought when Hillary Clinton came on stage a little before 10 Eastern time, I'm like, OK, they're they're probably going to make this pretty close. Hillary finishes. You're building up to Jill and Joe probably right after that. No, uh, they brought out Warnock. They brought out uh, Jasmine Crockett, who I, they might see as a rising star, but not exactly on the tier of Hillary Clinton and party notoriety at this point. You write on the, about all this in the jolt today. Uh, and the fact that it even got pushed that late was because we had to uh, listen to people drone on. Like New York Governor Kathy Hochul, who, for my money, regardless of ideology, Jim, she's the worst politician I've seen in a very long time, possibly ever. Listen to this stirring rhetoric. It's no wonder he had a fleet of Mar-a-Lago. 
Sorry about that, Florida. Sorry about that. Trump hasn't spent much time in New York lately, except that is to get convicted of 34 felonies. And that's just fine with us, because New York's motto is Excelsior, ever upward. And Trump takes us ever downward. Oh, my goodness. But then there was this uh, this one at the was the icing on the cake. Are you ready to elect Kamala Harris, the first pres- president of the United States? Yes, you are. I think George Washington would have something to say about that one. But, uh, Jim, there was a, a lot of people that didn't need to be there. They even had to cut people like Debbie Wasserman Schultz and probably three, four or five other people just to get to the Bidens as late as they did. So uh, I'm not sure what happened, but it was not a logistical masterpiece. Uh, So first of all, Greg, um, Kathy Hockle is the neighbor who has gone vegan and has done amazing things for her lower intestines and insists upon describing them to you in more detail than you want and won't shut up about it and keeps following you as you inch closer to your house and you desperately look for an ice pick to pierce your own eardrums so you don't have to hear it anymore. That's... (laughs) my assessment of Hockle as a uh, as a as a speaker. By the way, I apologize for like the first what, nine years on this podcast, but I called her Kathy Hochul. So anyway, there's there's that. The last night desperately needed an editor. And there there was some fairly serious logistical snafus. I'm not gonna give you the stories of how hard it is for journalists to get in last night. I, I no one cares about the problems of journalists. I will point out that you'd you'd rather have those journalists in the arena and covering the event than not and sitting on a uh, security line that was anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours for a whole bunch of people. Um, That's bad. But the really bigger problem was the delegates were stuck in a two hour uh, security line. Now, I want to point out Republicans in Milwaukee, this thing by comparison was a well oiled machine. I don't think I ever waited more than eh, 15, 20 minutes in a security line. And like, the U.S. Secret Service is running this. Like, they're professionals. I don't understand why you're having this. But that was one of the reasons things started late last night. Uh, and they ended up putting, you know, Biden speaking around the time Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon usually start. Um, but the second thing is, is that there were just way too many speakers. The night needed an editor. Somebody needed to look at this speaker lineup and say, some of these people we have to say no to. We don't need three lieutenant governors. We don't need... You, you went down the list, Greg. I forgot. Jamie Raskin. Jamie oh, yeah. Raskin. Like... like you're, you're not every congressman gets a speaking gig at the convention and uh, somebody needed to be a lot harsher. But I think like, you know, like I don't agree with him, but I feel like Warnock is that go figure. A preacher is a really good public speaker. Although somebody else pointed out Baptist speak preacher. We're not getting out of here for half an hour. By the way, I could just as easily make the same joke about priests and homilies. Or, you know, this is, this is not knocking around the Baptist. Just kind of observing that like there was just too much of it. And a lot of it was the same kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Trump bad, Biden good, Kamala Harris, greatest ever, isn't Tim Walls cool, et cetera. Curious about your thoughts on Steve Kerr, who I like, here's the thing, given a choice between a celebrity endorser, first of all, putting Steve Kerr back in the United Center is pretty good. The guy just won a gold medal in the, at the, uh, coaching the Olympic team, that, that's cool. Um, a lot of people didn't like the night-night thing to Trump and you know, using Steph Curry's move, but I'm just gonna like observe that like when it comes to having a celebrity come out and talk about your candidate, having Steve Kerr talk about the qualities you want to see in a leader, it's better than um, Amber Rose. I'm sorry. that, uh, And I, I don't think Amber Rose's remarks were that bad. I'm just like, it's a higher higher caliber there. Um, so there was just way too much of it. And as a result of it, there were empty seats for some of the early ones because the delegates couldn't get in. Uh, Biden's, like, it's clear, really hard to believe that they could miscalculate. Oh, we didn't expect there to be applause at a political convention. Um, and that thus, you know, Biden started so late. It literally looks like they didn't want him speaking anywhere near prime time because they didn't trust him. And let's face it, the last time Trump, uh, last time Biden was in prime time, it did not go well for him. <laughs> and so he started really late and he finished really late. And I, I suppose that's a do no harm. But th- like this, between this and Trump finishing after midnight, there's a certain lack of respect for the attention of the audience and the the patience of the audience. Um, and there was no need for, even with the applause, for, you know, interruptions, there was no need for, for Biden to speak for 50 minutes. And no. the whole thing was flabby and long-winded and repeating and droning on. It was just like, if it, like on me- technically, any one of these speeches did what they were supposed to do, hooray for Kamala Harris. Put all together, 
It was an interminable bore, and I don't know if it did what Democrats... I, it probably didn't cost Kamala Harris any votes, but it, no one's saying, wow, last night was a great night, and boy, the things were, you know... It, it made the Oscars look smooth and trimmed down to minimalism. Yeah, the best part about the Steve Kerr appearance was the video they played right at the beginning where he hit the game-winning shot in Game 6 of the 97 Finals. I'll always love him for that. It's uh, mm -hmm. a little more awkward since then. I'm thrilled they won the gold medal, of course. I noticed he didn't talk about how Kamala's going to get tough on China. Mm -hmm. uh, remember Go when he had, yeah. had the Warriors overseas well, and we couldn't get to that topic? Yeah. It's very complicated. We've got to talk yeah. to scholars. Or Iran and the mullahs. And when you know Steve Kerr's family history, that's kind of a, you know, a, like it's his life. I'm not going to tell him what issues he has to care about. But that having been said, apparently one of the, at one of the other delegate events, Tim Walls was described as America's first Chinese vice president. Now, this got everybody up in arms, so let me just reassure you, they don't mean ethnically everyone. They mean in terms of which countries he's loyal to. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, they found stories of uh, Tim Walls from back in the early 90s while he yeah. was teaching in Nebraska about how great it was in China. There's equality there. Everyone's equal. Communism is about sharing. That's why they have the gulags, is that everyone shares, you know, some people get early servings of misery, and some people get later servings of misery. <laughs> Everybody gets the same amount of rice. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think about it. Or less so. when the grain when the grain <laughs> harvest isn't as good as it should be. Yes, Five year exactly. plans. What are you gonna do? Exactly. Yeah, my favorite part of Jamie Raskin was when he talked the whole time about how Democrats are the ones uh, saving democracy, and then at the end he says, We have to win this election by so much that Trump and even his kangaroo Supreme Court can't overturn it. So glad he's really sticking up for our institutions yeah. there. Hey, uh, uh, Congressman Raskin, how many people voted for Harris in the primary? Just checking. <laughs> right, okay. That too. Look, in order to save democracy, they had to destroy it. All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now. And before Biden came out, he was introduced by his daughter, Ashley. And before that, it was uh, First Lady Jill Biden, who was uh, talking about, you know, Joe Biden's presidency and her time a little bit as First Lady. And she was talking about what she sees as the character of her husband. It's not something we would necessarily agree to. She talked about uh, all the difficult things that Joe Biden has had to do in his life and as president. And then she tried to snow us over with this line. And weeks ago, when I saw him dig deep into his soul and decide to no longer seek re-election and endorse Kamala Harris. Yeah, that's what happened. He reached deep into his soul. Meanwhile, over on CNN last night, Jake Tapper's got Nancy Pelosi, and he's saying to her, come on, come on, you shoved him overboard, right? And she says, yeah, I had to do, I did what I had to do. Have you talked I to him? I have to do what I have to do. Right. He made the decision for the country. My concern was not about the president. It was about his campaign. Yeah, he made the decision. It's like uh, being mugged by three people with aluminum baseball bats. And, oh, he decided to hand over his wallet. So uh, good job on that one, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Uh, still, got the, still got a little bit of blood under the fingernails there. <laughs> so the scenario I'm about to, to describe was always very unlikely. But since Joe Biden announced he was no longer going to be the Democratic nominee via Twitter, right? In, and, you know, took 20 minutes to remember, oh, and I endorsed Kamala Harris uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, th th there's, no, you know, he's given 11 minute speech in which he made this brief fleeting reference to an inability to unite my party. And we haven't had any real deep explanation of what what was the deciding factor? What was the final conversations? What what was going through his mind? And I was just mentioning to my colleagues on the post -pod, post podcast, that, like, when Trump went to speak at the Republican convention, even if you couldn't stand Trump, even if you weren't gonna vote for Trump, there was a lot of people who were just curious, what was it like to get shot in the ear? What was it like at that moment? What was going through your head? Were you, you know, afraid you were gonna die? You know, like what, you know, just, there was just a lot of natural curiosity about what this man had just experienced. And I kind of feel like there's a similar factor to Biden. And that, you know, there was, there was one line where he said something, I love my country, I love this job, I love, you know, being president, but I love my country more which was, you know, it's a good line, but he needed more of that. And he, I think if he'd actually gone and talked about, um, just, just elaborate and talk about how much he's, you know, what it meant to not pursue this. And what was the deciding factor? Now, I think we all suspect it was Nancy Pelosi holding his head above a toilet and flushing it and, and you know, saying, Give, say uncle, say uncle, you know, while, 
George Clooney and Barack Obama were, you know, kicking uh, Jill Biden in the shins or something. Like something was happening or or we're going to expose everything about Hunter and everything that's been out there already is the good stuff. You know, like um, what was it? And there was room there for him to say, you know, I love doing this job. I love my country. I love my party. I wanted to go out there and be the guy who brought you home a second term. But I looked at it. My team talked to me. And in the end, Kamala Harris can do this better than I can. Like, that would have been a really powerful moment. That would have been a genuine passing of the torch, a real sense. And, and he said he's going to be the best volunteer for them. And he said he's not angry. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> but if he'd gone into, you know, like, and the fact that this was a cursory or a very brief tacked on section to a speech that sounded like he was accepting the nomination for another four years is why I don't believe him. Um, but there was potential for a really powerful moment, and he skipped not to do it so that he could do the same old shouty thing. And I think that, um, look, I'm not in the business of telling, you know, of helping Democrats, but like that would have been a powerful moment, and they deliberately didn't have that. But hey, the whole thing was around Jimmy Kimmel time, so who cares? <laughs> couple follow-ups on that. Do you think he was, I'm sure he's still mostly mad about getting shoved aside. How much do you think there was an additional frustration about getting shoved way out of primetime? Wouldn't you love to be in the green room? And he sees, you know, Raskin or or like like Chris Coons. I I know they're buddies (laughs) and from Delaware. Really? We had to hear, you know, first lady. Okay. President's daughter. Okay. You know, but like there are a whole bunch of, of folks there who didn't, you know, and by the way, like, you know, they did skip the James Taylor performance. I, I know everybody at home was looking forward to that. He's seen fire. He's seen rain. And he's seen himself get canceled. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the, the, like, there were, uh, as you mentioned, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. By the way, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, were you surprised she's still, or she's still in Congress? <laughs> she, you know, <laughs> such a bang-up job at the DNC there. Um, but just kind of this sense that, like, why are we seeing every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the Democratic Party and pushing the, like, right around 1030, like, like, the entire night was running slow. You didn't need every union speaker. And you kind of sit there and think, like, was this part of, you know, the endorsement deal? Greg, it was like Oprah Winfrey all over again. You get a prime time speaking slot. You get a prime time seat. Everybody gets a prime time seat. And by the way, like, when you have a do- two dozen speakers in prime time or three dozen, however it you know, finally was, makes each one less special, right? And, like, sometimes when you do this really good, and the party, you know, has an eye for talent. It turn, you turns into a star-making moment, probably most notably Obama in 2004 in Boston at the convention that nominated Kerry. But when it's all, like, do you think people are going to be gushing about, oh, uh, you know, where were you when, when Chris Coons addressed the convention? <laughs> and tried to get the We Love Joe chant going unsuccessfully. Yeah, that's it. You can tell the audience, just bring them on. Bring them on. Let's get this over with. And parking's going to be a mess, you know. I bet they get Obama out there in the 10 o'clock hour tonight. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I guess that, that's likely to happen. Do we not have keynote speakers anymore? There used to be like an official yeah. keynote speaker, and now nobody has one. On paper, the head of the Teamsters was given the, the traditional slot of the, the keynote address at the Republican National Convention. Yeah. Which, by the way, like that whole thing about how, you know, hooray for unions, right, right to work stinks. Thank goodness Republicans are abandoning it. Corporations are bad. Like, yeah, yeah. Way to go, RNC. Yeah, that was their that was their biggest cell phone for sure. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see what else happens tonight. I think we get uh, Doug Emhoff tonight too. I'm sure everybody's setting their DVRs for that. So, Jim, uh, enjoy the day. Enjoy the United Center. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and join us again Wednesday for the next 3 Martini Lunch.